Okay, everyone. So, have you had a nice lunch? Yeah? You happy? Yeah? It helps with lunch, right? <laughs> As Ram always says that if you're going to ask him a question, uh, always ask after lunch, not before lunch. Uh, then he's really happy. <laughs> nice cup of tea. Oh, okay. He will do anything for you. Uh, actually, that's not true. He will not do anything for you. But <laughs> it's more likely. Uh, so, anyway, so let's um, come back to the. Uh, ideas of meditation again and how the Buddha teaches these things. Uh, and uh, we have been looking at the Anapanasati Sutta, which uh, I reckon is the main way of uh, the Buddha teaches meditation. So we'll have a little bit more look at that Sutta. And uh, then we shall look at some alternative suttas that kind of back up what is happening in the Anapanasati Sutta. So uh, are you okay with that? If you're not okay with it, it doesn't matter, I'm still going to do it. So <laughs> I'm sorry, this is the, the way forward. Sometimes you have, it's interesting, you, sometimes you read things and you sort of think, I don't want to hear that. Uh, yeah, uh, but actually that's when you should really listen, right? When you don't want to hear it. Because uh, that's where you have the potential for growth, right? When it's something that you find a bit dodgy or difficult or whatever, that's your chance for actually changing your worldview and seeing things in a new way. Uh. So I always recommend you, when you read the suttas and you see something that kind of is challenging, uh, don't reject it. Uh, Stay with it. Uh, I know for those of you with Sri Lankan background, probably no problem, right? But people with a Western background, okay, don't reject it. Wait, think, allow it to settle in uh, and see what happens over time. If you eventually have to reject it, fine, but at least give it a chance. Uh, and uh, then there is a, a scope for growth and for changing your uh, kind of some of our ingrained habits, etc. So uh, let me just uh, read a little bit more of the uh, Anapanasati Sutta, and then I will move over to some other suttas. Uh, so um, yes, we came to the point he establishes mind, or they establish mindfulness in front of them. Yeah, so the idea of having mindfulness in the present space and time, and that happens through uh, learning how to relax, learning how to be at ease. But what is very interesting, it also happens through a couple of more factors in Buddhism that enables mindfulness to happen. And these other things that enable mindfulness to happen, they are more like long-term commitments or long-term developments of the mind that you have to do. I will get back to those in a second. But basically, they are about right view and morality. Yeah, get right view and morality right, and the mind will tend in that direction, and it will tend to work. A lot of the time, if people have problems with uh, uh, establishing mindfulness of the breath, actually it can have to do with not, not right view being strong enough yet. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, so you have to change your attitude to the world. You have to see the world in a new way. You have to understand the, what the Buddha is all about. And all of these things, and as that right view falls into place, uh, your values change. Uh, and it's really a matter of values, because to watch the breath means you value the breath. You don't value thinking about the world, you don't value all this other stuff. And once your values change, your priorities change, and then the whole meditation process starts. So right view really makes a, makes a massive difference. And right view is, I'll come back to this later on, but right view is not something either you have it or you don't. Right view is, uh, comes in all kinds of degrees, uh, so you have to develop it and cultivate it. Uh, and uh, this is a very important part, in fact, of the path. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, but once you have established mindfulness in front of you, then just mindful you breathe in, mindful you breathe out. Uh, prior to this, you still breathe, but you're not mindful yet. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, you're allowed to breathe, right? Because just because you're not mindful, that, this doesn't mean you start breathing at this point. It means that you start being mindful at this point. Uh, sorry, I'm just being really silly here. <laughs> <laughs> I have a teacher, I learned from my teacher. He's kind of I've gone to school of Ajahn Brahm. So, um, it's interesting, just mindful, yeah? Why just mindful? Huh? And uh, sometimes, you know, the thing about the suttas is that uh, we sh one shouldn't really overinterpret little words like this. Uh, the Pali word for just is. Uh, <laughs> you, don't, you don't know, of course. I'm just being, again, I'm being naughty. The Pali word for just is eva. Eva means like just, or it means uh, like. Uh, um, it can also be a kind of a. Um, something that uh, emphasizes something, uh, yeah, an emphatic particle or something like that. Uh, but in many. 
a case it means just. And uh, I reckon that sometimes these little words have a very particular meaning. They actually are meaningful. Sometimes we have to be careful not to give too much emphasis on little words because the texts do change over time. But uh, sometimes they do have meaning. In this case here, Eva, to me, signifies the idea that when you meditate, there is no use to use willpower, there is no use to force yourself onto the breath. You are just mindful. Mindfulness has already been established, and that is now all you have to do. You don't have to do anything more now. And uh, this is uh, very interesting, right? Uh, and uh, you may think that a lot hinges on my interpretation of a small little word. Uh, maybe you think that I'm deluded uh, because I'm kind of going too far with a small little word, but it fits in with the overall context of the Dhamma. And this is what we should do. We should always ask ourselves, what is the overall context? And then we can decide more likely the meaning of these little words. And of course, for me, one of the contexts was always Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, I remember when I started out listening to Ajahn Brahm's talks, and I said, oh, Ajahn, it's not working for me. What should I do? He said, sit longer. And I said, oh, I've been sitting for so long. What should I do? Sit longer. And this was kind of his mantra in those days, sit longer. Everything was about sitting longer. And uh, then he refined his instructions after a few years, and he realized he has to refine the instructions. He said, he added a very important phrase to sit longer, don't do anything here. <laughs> this was kind of Ajahn Brahm's meditation. You get sit longer and don't do anything. This was kind of his two main teachings. Uh, and uh, I always thought, but, you know, and then people would come to Ajahn Brahm and say, but nothing happens, I don't do anything, and, uh, you know, I just think, or I just fall asleep, or nothing happens, or, you know, what's going on there? And uh, so I, I always was a bit skeptical to this idea of not doing anything, because many people really had a hard time making sense of that. Uh, but then I started to really look at the suttas more carefully, and then you come across a sutta, which I was going to have a look at later on, I may still have a look at that, uh, it's called the Chaitanya Sutta, and it specifically says, this process of meditation cannot be done by an act of intention. Na chetanaya karaniya. Chetanaya, by intention. Na, not karaniya, to be done. Not to be done by an act of intention. Specifically says that. And then it says why, and the reason why is it because meditation happens in accordance with nature. There is a natural sequence, and this natural sequence evolves according to natural laws. Can you force natural laws to happen through an act of will? No. If you try to force nature to happen through an act of will, you just mess things up. Yeah. I'll give you an example. This is an example that comes straight from Ajahn Brahm. So, uh, and he, say, he says that it's like a, a child. And the mother wants to teach the child how to grow a plant. So it gives you a sunflower seed, you plant the sunflower seed in the ground, right? And then the, the mother says, okay, you go and water that plant every day. It's a small child, maybe four years old, right? Uh, doesn't, don't, still very, very, hasn't got much understanding of the world. So every day comes and water that plant. Mommy, mommy, when is it? What, nothing is happening. I've been watering it for two days already. How long do I have to keep watering for? And then maybe after a week or so, maybe something starts to come through the ground. And the child is really excited. Mommy, look, yeah, it's coming through the ground. But then after it's coming through the ground, it only grows by a couple of millimeters every day. Yeah? And the child gets really impatient already. Yeah? Plants grow according to natural laws, yeah? as according to nature. Yeah? But the child is too impatient and decides to help the plant with growing a little bit faster. Yeah? So it grabs hold of the little green coming through and helps, I'm going to pull it, mommy, I'm going to pull it to help you grow faster. Yeah? You cannot pull a plant to make it grow faster. It goes against the laws of nature. And of course, you destroy the plant as a consequence. And that is like meditation using willpower. It's like pulling on a natural thing. Yeah? Yeah? Things that has to grow in accordance with its own natural laws. And if you try to make it grow faster, then you're going to destroy the meditation. And so I was very happy. And after a while, I started to realize this is a theme throughout the suttas. The theme is this, you know, that actually willpower is not really the way to go. In fact, the whole process of meditation is an anti-willpower process. What is very interesting here, when you take the Anapanasati Sutta and you compare it with this other Sutta, which is the Chaitanya Sutta, and you put them next to each other, I have made some neat tables, 
I show, I'm going to show you my knee tables one of, one of these days. Yeah, my table. I have the Anapanasati Sutta there. I have the um, Chaitanya Sutta next to it. Uh, then I have the Seven Factors of Awakening next to that, uh, and then I have the Sutta on the uh, 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 kind of uh, similar to the uh, to the Chaitanya Sutta, except it starts with kind of the Anusati's recollection. So I put all of these next to each other, and I show how similar they are. Yeah, how they basically have the same pattern. Or factors. They say no attachment is good, but sometimes when the rope attaches a little bit to the body, that's a good thing. It doesn't fall off all the time. That's one area I'm not following as a Brahma. But, uh, <laughs> and so, um, uh, and when you put the, these things next to it, you really recognize that there is this pattern that is actually pervasive in the suttas. Yeah? The same process, meditation happens in the same way, uh, again and again. Slight variations on the theme. Uh, and of course, those variations on the theme are very interesting because they bring out new points uh, about the Dhamma. I think the battery might be dying or something. Uh, the, uh, it's cutting out sometimes. So. Um, and um, we, yeah. So, um, and so you recognize this pattern uh, that you see again and again in the sutta. And then what that pattern really tells you, uh, it tells you two things. Uh, and it tells you that the two main things that decide whether meditation is going right or not, the two qualities that are being developed consistently in meditation, uh, is on the one hand, uh, happiness, uh, yeah? Happiness of various degrees, joy, gladness, happiness. Uh, more and more refined happiness, deeper and deeper levels of happiness, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, peace. Yeah, peace becoming deeper and deeper and deeper, tranquility, joy, deeper and deeper and deeper and more profound. Uh, these are the two things uh, that you see consistently uh, in the suttas uh, as uh, part of this process. Uh, and um, that is a... Uh, does it want, this should go in there? Yeah. Do you want yeah. it? Do I want it? Yeah. Okay, easy for my hand, am I? Okay, all right. You're very compassionate there, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so these, two these are the two qualities that you should always uh, uh, look for in meditation. Can you hear this all right? Is it all right? Yeah? Okay. The sound was a bit different, but that's all right. Uh. And so this is how you know that meditation is heading kind of in the right direction, yeah? These two things are kind of building up, building up, building up. Uh, and uh, all the way through, it is without this idea of... Uh, Willpower, yeah? these things are phenomena that arise uh, when you withdraw the willpower. That, that, okay, this is where I was heading, I was coming back to me. I was, sometimes you lose what you're talking about. You keep on talking until it comes back to you. This is just, I'm revealing some of the tricks of speaking in this way. <laughs> you just kind of randomly say some kind of arbitrary things and then kind of it gradually comes back to you again. So this is kind of the, uh, the, uh, one of the tricks of public speaking. Yeah? You learn this uh, kind of <laughs> when you do this. So... Uh, uh, and of course, when you, things become more and more peaceful, uh, the reason why they do that uh, is because the will is being withdrawn. Yeah? The will is what keeps things in motion. Uh, the will is what uh, uh, kind of leads to activity in your meditation, leads to changes in perception, uh, leads to uh, you know, the feeling of things not being peaceful. Uh, so this whole process is actually a calming down uh, of the will. Uh, yeah? You can see that. Uh, so the idea is to withdraw as much will as you possibly can from the very beginning uh, and allow that to continue through the process of meditation as it goes along. Uh. So this is how the will is gradually abandoned. Uh. Uh, this is uh, then the idea of no will. And uh, so I'm, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to come back to the Anapanasati Sutta. So this one word, Eva, seems to have that kind of implication to it. Yeah? Just mindful. Uh, nothing more is required except for awareness itself. And then comes the process of meditation uh, from the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta. right? And uh, it goes as follows, yeah, breathing in heavily, this is Adan Sudhatu's translation, it means like a long breath, yeah, long heavy breath, they know I breathe in heavily, breathing out heavily, they know I'm breathing out heavily, 
Breathing in lightly, they know I'm breathing in lightly. Breathing out lightly, they know I'm breathing out lightly. Yeah. They practice like this. I'll breathe in experiencing the whole body. Yeah. They practice like this. I'll breathe out experiencing the whole body. Yeah. They practice like this. I'll breathe in stilling, stilling the physical process. Yeah. They practice like this. I'll breathe out stilling the physical process. Yeah. So you know about the length of the breath. And... Uh, this is not really so much about knowing the length or the shortness of the breath. It's just about being aware of the breath. Yeah? And when you are aware of the breath, well, then you have an idea whether it's long or short because it comes kind of with the territory of being aware of the breath. So the significant thing here is really just being aware of the breath. Some people have short breath, some have long breath. The general tendency is for the breath to get shorter because you need less oxygen as you carry on. Yeah? So it tends to be lighter. It's a general idea, but you are just basically aware of the breath. That's what's going on here. And then as you carry on with your meditation, because you are calming down and your awareness is expanding, you see more of the breath. So you are aware of the whole body, it says here. The obvious interpretation is that this means the whole breath body. There are many good reasons for thinking that. Uh, especially because the breath is called the body just further down in the text, uh, yeah, specifically. So I think that is the obvious interpretation here. So you, you, your awareness is expanding out. Uh, yeah, you're seeing more uh, and you're feeling more present, more fully aware. You're not losing your sense of uh, contact with the breath at any point, uh, but you're with the breath all the time. Uh, sharpness is coming. Yeah, the dullness is going down. Uh, that dullness you have initially is actually starting to disappear. Uh, and then the next stage then is calming down the physical process. The physical process here obviously is the main part of that at this point, uh, is the breath, yeah? Because all the other things tend to fade into the background already. Uh, and what really remains is the breath itself. Uh, that is not calming down. Uh. Yeah, I remember what I was saying, that the two things in meditation, more and more happiness, more and more calming down. Uh, calming down already here is kind of coming, coming in already. Uh. So already at this point, it's becoming very pleasant. Uh, yeah, it, it's actually almost at the very beginning of the sutta, it becomes pleasant. Uh, but certainly now, it's becoming really pleasant already because it's becoming very peaceful, uh, really, really nice. Uh, the kind of thing, uh, things are really calming down beautifully. Uh, and uh, so that is then basically, I'm going fairly quickly now, that's basically what is called the first uh, Tetrad, the four, first four factors of uh, mindfulness of breathing, and it is equivalent to body contemplation in the Satipatthana Sutta. Now uh, we come to the next four factors, yeah? Fact, factors five to eight, uh, and this is where it starts to get really, really interesting here. Yeah? So uh, this is how it goes. Uh, yeah, they practice like this: uh, I'll breathe in, experiencing rapture. Uh, they practice like this, I'll breathe out, experiencing rapture. They practice like this, I'll breathe in, experiencing bliss. They practice like this, I'll breathe out, experiencing bliss. They practice like this, I'll breathe in, experiencing mental processes. They practice like this, I'll breathe out, experiencing mental processes. They practice like this, I'll breathe in, stilling the mental processes. I'll practice like this, I'll breathe out, stilling the mental processes. So this is all about joy, yeah? starting with rapture. Uh, rapture is a translation of the Pali word piti. Uh, yeah? Piti means like joy of the mind, rapture. Rapture is like kind of waves of joy and these kind of things happening in the body and the mind. Uh, kind of, it's hard to really dis distinguish exactly where it's happening, but it's kind of your entire being feels like it has this kind of uh, bliss in it. Uh, and then it moves on to bliss, which is sukha, which is an even more profound kind of happiness. Uh, then it talks about the mental processes. The mental processes are precisely the bliss. Yes, yeah? so you're now experiencing the bliss. Uh, and then again, you are stilling the mental processes. You're calming down things even more. Uh, yeah? So here we are at the very core of these things I was talking about before. Uh, bliss. Uh, and calm, yeah, happiness and joy, uh, happiness and uh, tranquility uh, that you see coming together, yeah, right here in this particular uh, uh, part of the Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of 
very attractive, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's kind of extraordinary that there is such a thing in the world. If the Buddha hadn't come around and taught us these kind of things, uh, we would be wandering our lives, doing shopping in uh, the local supermarket, uh, Safeway or whatever, I don't know what they call these days anymore, uh, and we would think that is the highest bliss in samsara. And you didn't know about these things, yeah? And here, when you see these things, it's kind of there's something extraordinarily attractive about this. Yeah? We have some idea what it means already. Everyone has probably experienced some joy in their life at some point, some degree of tranquility. And here the Buddha kind of takes it to deeper and deeper levels. Uh, and you can affect these things by living in the right way. That is kind of the wonderful and marvelous and amazing message coming out of these suttas. Uh. So something very positive about this. Uh. Now, one thing I want to point out, which I like to point out at this particular stage, uh, and that is that very common in the Welcome to the Paparazzi. Uh, and <laughs> one of the things that uh, is very common in Buddhist uh, circles around the world is this idea that as a Buddhist, uh, you should experience pain, right? Or if you experience pain, there's nothing wrong with that. You should just sit with the pain, watch the pain, learn from it, get insight into it, and hang out with the pain. It's good for you. But I have so much pain, observe the pain. Uh, Please, I have too much pain. Observe the pain. That's like a mantra. Just keep on observing until you go crazy and you never go back on the retreat again because of that. So that's kind of self-defeating, they call that. And so um, uh, what is very interesting right here yeah, is that uh, there is nothing about observing pain. All there is is piti, sukha. There is a, a citta sankara. Yeah, which is the feelings, and then there's citta sankara, pasambayang, something like that. Uh, yeah, all about happiness, uh, and that is kind of extraordinary. Uh, because uh, why then do people talk about all this pain? If you can fulfill satipatthana by watching the bliss, uh, why do you have to go on retreats where they tell you to watch the pain? Uh, and the reason is because they focus only on the satipatthana sutta. In the Satipatthana Sutta, it says that you're supposed to have niramisa dukkha, no, samisa dukkha, which means worldly pain. So if, because it says that in the Satipatthana Sutta, <laughs> if you watch the worldly pain, you will make progress on the path. But here the Buddha says, no need to watch the worldly pain. So which one are you going to choose? <laughs> choose this one, right? <laughs> and uh, the point is that um, understanding worldly pain Understanding that in the way it is expressed in the Satipatthana Sutta, you don't have to actually watch it. You understand these things by their absence. And this is one of those very important things to understand about the nature of insight. Insight does not happen because you're watching something. Insight happens when something disappears. If you go to the very end of the Anapanasati Sutta, it talks about Anichanupasi. Viraga nupasi, um, niroda nupasi, patinisagga nupasi. Yeah, you know, you know those terms at the end of the Anapanasati Sutta. Yeah. So the first one is contemplating impermanence, uh, anicca nupasi, contemplating fading away, viraga nupasi, contemplating cessation, uh, niroda nupasi, uh, contemplating cessation. Right. Uh, so what that means is that when things cease. Uh, that is where your contemplation becomes the most profound, or very close to the most profound. Because when something is completely gone, it is only then that you can understand what it is. This is like the old famous old simile with the tadpole and the frog, right? It was good fun. I just came from Poland yesterday. I landed at Heathrow Airport yesterday, and I went straight from there into London and gave my talk. It was really quite nice. Just ding, ding, just dhamma, dhamma, dhamma all the way. Thinking about dhamma on the plane, thinking about dhamma on the tube, and getting into the... It was, it was quite nice. And then, but what was cool about uh, Poland, I was giving the simile a lot in Poland about the tadpole and the frog. Yeah? And so I learned these two words in Polish. Uh, tadpole in Polish. I can't remember what it is anymore now, but I learned it at the time. Uh, forgotten already. I'm in, I'm in the UK now, so I've got to forget about the Polish. Uh, uh, and I learned frog. Yeah? So I was, I was saying these things in, in Polish during the talks. And that went down really well, actually. Yeah? So it was, <laughs> it was kind of cool. But it's a very beautiful simile because the idea is that if you are a tadpole, uh, you cannot properly know what water is. You are in water all the time. There is no reference point. There is nothing to compare it with. You are always wet. Yeah? There's no, uh, there's no, there's, you can't relate it to anything. But when you get out of the water, when you become a frog, 
then, wow, now I understand what water is. And the, everything in life is like that. Yeah? When things cease, when they disappear, when they are gone, only then can you really understand it. And so there is, I've got good news for everyone here, there's no need to contemplate the painful feelings. Oh, painful, painful. <coughs> Wait till you have the happy feelings, then contemplate the painful feelings. Isn't that good news? Yeah. So enjoy the meditation. Yeah. Don't, don't make it into some kind of nightmare meditation, which many people do, unfortunately. Yeah. And this is the message right here. But um, what is very interesting then is how do we move? We've just been talking about body contemplation, about making the breath more and more refined and peaceful, and then moving on to contemplating the feelings and the bliss. How do we move from contemplating the body to contemplating feelings? Because it doesn't, ideally it happens automatically. Ideally it's like you kind of just follow the breath and as you follow the breath it becomes peaceful. Happiness just arises, yeah, because the process is working in the right way. Huh? But it doesn't always happen. Huh? And it's quite common for people to experience peace in the meditation, but without the bliss actually arising. Huh? So what can we do to make that happen? Huh? And one of the ways of making it happen is to contemplate a little bit more on the body. Yeah? In the uh, Satipatthana Sutta we have the idea of the 31 parts of the body. Uh, and the more you reject the body, the more likely the mind is to move towards bliss. Yeah? Because bliss we're moving more into the mental realm, giving up the body a bit more. So by doing a contemplation that actually allows you to get rid of the body a bit more, it's also more likely that you will then move on towards uh, bliss in meditation. So sometimes you can do, or if you think 31 parts of the body is a bit too uncomfortable, uh, maybe do four element meditation, right? Four elements is a bit more neutral. Uh, okay, the body is the same as the external elements. It's quite easy to see that, uh, so you can just do that contemplation. But you can also do 31 parts of the body. Uh, sometimes I like to think of myself without skin. It's kind of nice. You take, peel the skin off your face. Have you ever tried that before? Uh, and they had this uh, exhibition in uh, Australia. There was a German fellow, one of these uh, crazy Germans. <laughs> no, actually, I, I, really cool, yeah? A really cool, cool fellow called Günther von, ha von Hagen. Have you heard about him? Uh, so he, was, uh, he had this, uh, thing, uh, this exhibition called Körperwelten or something like that. Yeah, remember that one? Yeah, a really cool guy. But if, I, I don't know. Uh, and so he had this, this technique, he called it Plasti plastination or something like that of the body. So if you take a corpse, someone was dead. I don't know how he got hold of those corpses. That's a well-kept secret. But <laughs> so he got these corpses, and then he had a technique whereby he would kind of infuse the body with silicon somehow. So the body was kept, right? Even though he somehow drained the liquids out and then kind of replaced it with silicon or some kind of special technique, and they would keep for long, long periods of time. And then he would start taking the skin off, right? And these kind of things, and kind of, so you could see everything in the body. And that's still probably quite beautiful compared to what it really looks like, because it was probably done up a little bit. Uh, and so they had this exhibition, because he was traveling around the world, this exhibition, you can see all of these uh, bodies without skin on them. Uh, and it's amazing what difference the skin makes. <laughs> yeah, this thin layer of the body, yeah, this thin little thing on, on the body, it makes every difference in what, whether the body is beautiful or not. Uh, and uh, so sometimes if you want to kind of get a bit of neutrality about the body, just imagine not other people's body, but your own body without skin. Uh, looking at yourself in the mirror without skin on your face. Uh, it's pretty, it's very kind of, uh, it's very in your face. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, so I'm just saying that these are the ways of countering some of the attraction to the body, yeah, which is very deep-seated. Uh, and when you do that, you get a more neutral feeling. It enables you more to move more towards the uh, blissful experiences. Uh, but there's, I have another. I have good news for you. There's another way of doing this, uh, which is more, much more uh, pleasurable than uh, you know, doing this kind of 31 parts of the body or whatever. Uh, and that is uh, the uh, contemplation, uh, the anusattis, yeah, like Buddha anusatti and these sort of things. And I want to talk a little bit about the idea of Buddha anusatti. Before I do that, however, I want to talk very briefly about the foundations of Satipatthana. Yeah, what it is that is like the ground for Satipatthana 
to work. And Satipatthana, because that includes mindfulness of breathing, what is the ground, the basis upon which we should practice mindfulness of breathing? Now this is a sutta from the uh, Sangyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha. Wake up, baby. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and this sutta is um, called A Monk. And this is uh, uh, the connected discourses on Satipatthana, the third sutta. So if you're interested, you can look it up yourself. And uh, this is a tiny little extract of a little bit longer sutta. And this is how it goes. This is, a, this is a monk who is speaking to the Buddha. And he says, Sir, may the Buddha please teach me the Dhamma in brief. May the Holy One teach me the Dhamma in brief. Hopefully I can understand the meaning of what the Buddha says. Hopefully I can be an heir of the Buddha's teaching. That's how you should ask yeah, if you want to get some uh, senior person like the Buddha or, I don't know, maybe Ajahn Brahm to teach you, this is what you have to say. Yeah? <laughs> what the best thing to say is, please teach the Dhamma out of compassion. This is the usual thing in the suttas. Yeah? Then the Buddha replies, uh, well then, mendicant, uh, you should purify the starting point of skillful qualities. Uh, what is the starting point of skillful qualities? Uh, well-purified ethics and correct view. When your ethics are well-purified and your view is correct, you should develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation in three ways, depending on and grounded on ethics. Yeah? So the two things that are the foundation here yeah, uh, for Mindfulness meditation, and mindfulness meditation is satipatthana practice, it is mindfulness of breathing. The two things are very interesting, ethics and right view, morality and right view. And uh, so this gives you the answer to the very simple question. Uh, if your meditation is not going as well as you think it should do, uh, this is the reason. Uh, either your ethics is not good enough, uh, or your right view isn't uh, right enough, uh, or more likely a combination of the two. Uh, yeah, that is where you need to look. Yeah. So one of the things about the Dhamma practice, and remember the bar that we are trying to clear when it comes to ethical conduct is a very high bar to clear. Huh? Yeah, it is the Buddha's ideas about ethics are the most, some of the most profound ideas of ethics in any philosophy or religion you can find anywhere. Huh? Yeah, because it is so all-encompassing. It's about our entire character. Huh? Is it a character that is kind, compassionate, uh, caring, yeah. Um, not fault-finding, yeah? Is that the kind of character? So it's a whole character. So in other words, it's about how you think, how you act, how you speak, how you perceive. Everything has to be purified in this way. Yeah? And it's not just about avoiding the bad, it's about doing the good. Literally going out of your way to do the good. Yeah. And so it, all of this comes together. Yeah? And so uh, there's always, almost always, more scope for purifying your morality more. Yeah? Because it is a very... Uh, is a very demanding kind of morality the Buddha is asking us to, uh, uh, to practice. So look at your morality. Uh, but um, the other side here, which is in many ways perhaps even more interesting, uh, is that you have to have right view for your meditation to work. Uh, why is that? Uh, what's it got to do with right view? Uh, well, it has to do with right view. This is what I was saying before, is that when you see the world in the way the Buddha saw the world, yeah, your values get right, and because your values are right, you prioritize in the right way. And because you prioritize in the right way, when you come to watching the breath, you don't prioritize thinking about dinner this evening. Yeah? You don't prioritize thinking about uh, what you're going to do when you get finished with this blooming retreat. Uh, yeah? But you prioritize watching the breath. Uh. There's a nice sutta in the um, Anguttara Nikaya 3, is number 70, Visaka. To Visaka, Lady Visaka. Yeah, you know, all know about Lady Visaka, of course. <coughs> and uh, she goes to the Buddha and she asks the Buddha, very good question, by the way, how should you practice the Uposita to make the most out of it? Yeah, what is the right way of practicing the Uposita? And the Buddha says, well, there are some people, they practice the Uposita, they go and meditate, and when they meditate, they think, oh, when I get finished with these eight precepts this evening or tomorrow morning, I'm going to eat this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to cook food like this. And they start salivating, thinking about all the food they're going to have tomorrow. And uh, well, that's the wrong way of practicing the Uposita. Yeah? Yeah? The mind gets completely involved with the worldly phenomenon. Yeah? 
And then there's another way, which is even kind of worse. I'm not even going to mention it. It's the idea that I'm going to be kind to all beings within a circle of 20 kilometers, but not to beings beyond that. <laughs> I don't even understand how that is a possible view. But anyway, that seems like someone had that kind of view. It sounds really weird. And then there is the real Iposita, yeah, which is practice having metta for all four directions. There's a beautiful idea of what, where, we go, where we go wrong. Yeah? And uh, so um, uh, when our view is right, uh, yeah, our values are right. We want to watch the breath. We don't want to think about uh, all of these other things in the world, thinking about our work, our family, all of these things. And uh, the reason why we don't want to think about this uh, is because we understand the downside, the limitations of the, the five sense world. Uh, the five sense world is inherently problematic. Yeah? Inherently lets you down. It has wars in Ukraine. It has climate change in it. Uh, it has refugee crisis. It has volcanoes and tsunamis. It has asteroids crashing into the planet. It has computer viruses. Uh, it has, uh, you know, it has all of these terrible things. Uh, iPhones, yeah, that's even worse than computer virus. But uh, all of these things that this world of the five senses has that are actually very, very problematic. And we never know when the next disaster is going to come. And in the end, we're going to have to die here. In the end, every person we love in this world is going to have to die here. It's heartbreaking. Life is literally heartbreaking. Everyone is going to have a heart, broken heart at some point in their life almost. Uh, unless you are super duper wise, like the Buddha maybe. So there is a very profound problems with the five sense world. And the good news is that there is an alternative world. And that alternative world starts with meditation practice. It starts with a spiritual path. It starts with experiencing all of these beautiful qualities within her. Yeah. So there is an alternative. That is really the right view. And very much of that right view Part of that, it comes from having a confidence and faith in the Buddha himself, because the Buddha is the person who gives us these particular teachings. Uh, if you have confidence in this kind of outlook that the world is like this, uh, it means that you also have been listening to the Buddha, you're taking the Buddha seriously. Uh, so one of the foundational things uh, to give rise to joy on the Buddhist path is to actually have a relationship with the Buddha, uh, to start to kind of feel who the Buddha was as a person. Uh, and once you start to get a feeling for the Buddha, then these things can often come together in a very good way. So I want to talk a little bit about how to contemplate the Buddha. Now, this is very important for people like me who have grown up in the Western culture because I didn't grow up with the Buddha. I didn't know anything about the Buddha until I was, I don't know how old I was when I first heard about the Buddha probably mid-twenties at least. Before that, I was really ignorant about Buddhism. And um, uh, so it's very important for people who have grown up in a non-Buddhist culture because we have the relationship with the Buddha is very... We haven't been built up since we were small, so it's kind of distant and diff difficult to make. Yeah. But it is also important for people who have grown up in a Buddhist culture. Yeah. And the reason is because the kind of idea that you get when you grow up in a Buddhist culture uh, are ideas that are not really about the Buddha, but they are about mythology. They are about a legend that was written a long time after the Buddha existed. Uh, so you, what you have is you have a relationship to, with a legend rather than with the Buddha of the suttas. Uh. So I think it's important both for people who have grown up with the idea of a Buddha and for those who have not grown up with the idea of Buddha, it is actually useful to contemplate a little bit about who the Buddha was and what he represents. And then kind of make more out of, who, uh, of this idea of a Buddha contemplation, the Buddha Nusati. So the um, traditional way of uh, contemplating the Buddha in the suttas is the Itipiso formula. Yeah? Itipiso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddho Vijja Charana Sampanno Sugato Loka Vidu, etc. You all know that one, right? Especially those of you who have grown up as Buddhists, uh, yeah, you will know this backwards and forwards. Uh, and, uh, and many here who were born and grew up in Sri Lanka, huh? yeah? Most, many of you grew up in Sri Lanka, okay, so you would know these kind of things. You, kind of, you, you get that with the mother's milk in Sri Lanka, right? You hear it on the radio, you hear it in the Kind of when you go to the temple and the parents will play it to you and then I don't know if they will chant it to you when you go to bed. I don't know, but yes? Uh, 
Okay, it is so Bhagavad Gita hang samma. Okay, the it is so thus he is the Buddha, the Buddha Bhagavad, the Blessed One. It is so Bhagavad Gita arah hang the arah hang the fully awakened one. It is so arah hang samma sam Buddha the fully awakened Buddha samma sam Buddha vidya chadana sampano who is who is endowed with knowledge vidya chadana and conduct vidya chadana sampano sugato. How do I get the sequence right now? Sugato is like the, the one who has gone to a good destination, Lokavita, the knower of the world. Anuttaro Puddhisadamma Sadati, the unsurpassed trainer, teacher, um, trainer of tameable people. That's an interesting one. You've got to be tameable, otherwise, you have a problem. Sugatamma <laughs> Sadati, Satta Deva, my teacher of gods and humans. Buddha Bhagava, the Buddha, the Blessed One. That's a rough translation. Now I'm going to give you the meaning here. <laughs> so, um, uh, and so that is the standard formula. And it's a very, very, very interesting formula. But uh, I want to kind of uh, talk about this in a little bit more loose kind of way here. Yeah, so that we kind of get an idea of the Buddha in a, from a slightly looser perspective. Basically, it's, it's borrowing from this formula, but it's talking about it in a way that is more contemporary and perhaps, perhaps more relatable in some ways. Yeah. So, um, the first thing to understand about the Buddha, which uh, we often get wrong, is that the Buddha, before his awakening, was a human being. Yeah? And that is extraordinarily important. Because if the Buddha was a human being, it means that we can relate directly to the Buddha. What the Buddha teaches is relevant to us. The practice that the Buddha did before his awakening, when he was the Buddha-to-be, is the kind of practice that we should also be doing. And when you read the suttas, very often you come to these autobiographical accounts where the Buddha talks about his own life. And they only make sense if the Buddha is like us. Yeah? Because he's telling, this is what I did, you should be doing the same. That only makes sense if the Buddha is human just like us. And so uh, a lot of the later Buddhist ideas, where the Buddha becomes kind of elevated out of ordinary human beings, especially bad in Mahayana Buddhism, but also happens in Theravada Buddhism as well. Especially some of the ideas when the Buddha is said to have lived as the uh, uh, ascetic Sumedha, 28 Buddhas ago, and he bows down at the feet of the Buddha Dipankara, and he makes the vow to become the, future, become the Buddha of the future for incalculable eons from now. None of that has any place in the suttas. All of that is later legend. All of that elevates the Buddha into being something superhuman, way beyond what ordinary people are. And so all of that we have to really forget about and unlearn. And in a sense realize the Buddha, even in his last life before his awakening, was very much like us. The more you read the suttas, you see the Buddha had defilements, like us, yeah. Not the Buddha, the Buddha to be had defilements, just like us. He talks about ill will, greed, yeah, these things are there. He had attachments, yeah, we know from the Sutta that's talking about the attachments. It talks about this in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Noble Search Sutta, Majjhima 26, about his attachment to these things in the world. And then he goes on the Noble Search to get rid of that. Uh, we um, Knows he had wrong view. He talks about having wrong view, yeah, that he practices all these stupid ascetic practices for no reason. He had the wrong view that pain leads to happiness. He says that specifically. This is in the Bodhi Raja Kumara Sutta, Prince Bodhi, Majjhimarika 28, uh, 85. So uh, you find these things in many, many places uh, where the Buddha comes across very much like he is an ordinary human being. You can recognize those ordinary human qualities in the Buddha to be here, uh, just like you can recognize them in yourself. Uh, the Buddha is human. Uh, it humanizes the Buddha. Yes, he had some very powerful spiritual qualities that enabled him to make the breakthrough to become the Buddha, but in the final analysis, uh, he is human. Uh, this is a very important starting point, yeah, because it means that we have a way of relating to the Buddha very directly. Just like you can talk to Ajahn Brahm yeah, when he comes here, huh? and uh, Ajahn Brahm seems, does he seem human, or what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> well, he's human in some ways at least, right? He sits there, he looks kind of, he looks human. So I, w I would say he's human. 
And so just like you can talk to any other human, you can also talk to the Buddha in that way. Yeah? You can ask questions. Uh, you may feel it's a bit kind of scary to meet the Buddha. Would anyone feel it was scary to meet the Buddha? Huh? Or would you feel kind of really relaxed about that? Oh yeah, hi, how are you going, Buddha? Uh, mm-hmm. would, uh, yeah, would you feel kind of, oh, okay, I better be careful what I say now. Uh, <laughs> probably, I, I don't know, if I w- were to meet the Buddha, I'd probably feel a little bit kind of apprehensive. <laughs> okay, I better, better not think any bad thoughts. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, of course, if you think bad thoughts, the Buddha, does, he knows exactly what thoughts you're thinking. <clears throat> because you're human, and human thinks such bad thoughts. Uh, so, oh yeah, you're thinking about killing somebody, that's all right, please come, please come to over there. <laughs> I'm just going to get some water, just a second. <clears throat> so the Buddha is human, or he was human before he became the Buddha. Of course, once you are the Buddha, you have kind of gone beyond your ordinary humanity. You're still human in the sense that you are there, you are in the flesh and blood, you can talk like ordinary people. But you have gone beyond some of the ordinary human things like defilements and uh, suffering and these kind of things. That makes you obviously quite unique. That's why you become the Buddha. But uh, so what happens uh, when the Buddha becomes the Buddha? What actually is going on? Well, after the Buddha... He had his awakening experience, right? One of the first things that he thinks after his awakening is that he thinks, I don't want to teach. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, this is found in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Noble Search. I don't want to. Why not? Because it's too troublesome. It's really difficult to uncover this truth of the Dhamma, all this non-self business, really, really hard to understand. I'm going to be wasting my time. I'm going to kind of, I'd rather just chill and meditate, and have a good time, go to a cave somewhere, and rather than talk people, tell people, we're not going to understand any. What's the point of teaching people we're not going to understand? Okay, and his mind inclines towards non-teaching. That is the story. And then uh, Brahma Sahampati comes and says, please, please, Venerable Sir, teach. Please, 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 please teach. Uh, there are people in the world, they are going to be in be serious trouble unless you teach. There are people in the world with little dust in their eyes who have the ability to understand. Please teach them. And then the Buddha surveys the world yeah, with his Buddha eye. I'm not sure exactly what, what he does, but he has some kind of overview of the world. And then he realizes that actually, yes, there are people in the world who are ready for the teaching. Yeah. Yeah, and it may have been that he just remembered his encounters with people from before. That may have been all that the Buddha actually means. Because uh, uh, he, the first thing he talks about teaching afterward is Alara Kalama and Uddaka Ramabhuta. You know those people? Yeah, yeah? Okay, you are all very well educated. So that's wonderful. Uh, so these were the Buddha's first two teachers. Uh, and uh, so then he decides, yeah, once he has that, then he says, compassion arises in the Buddha. Uh, he has not had compassion before, right? So this idea that the Buddha was motivated by compassion before his awakening, again, that also doesn't fit with the suttas. Only after his awakening. Then compassion arises. Then he decides to teach the world because the Buddha knows that he has the answer to the problem that people are affected by. He has the answer, yeah, because he has seen the Dhamma, which means understanding the human condition, understanding suffering and happiness, understanding how to move from suffering to happiness. All of that is understood. So he has the answer everyone in the world wants. Yeah, everyone wants a reduction in problems and suffering. Everyone wants happiness of, of one kind or another. Call it what you like. Yeah. So he has the answer, and now he has the motivation, the driving force, which is the compassion to, uh, to do this. Uh, so, and this is very, very interesting, yeah, because it, what it means is that the Buddha has no vested interest in teaching the Dhamma. The Buddha doesn't want to have disciples. Yeah? His, his mind is actually leaning in a different direction. He wants to go into a cave and just meditate. Disciples are just a hassle. Yeah, why on earth would you I don't want disciples? Yeah? He doesn't want any requisites. He doesn't want any fame. He doesn't want any of this worldly stuff. Yeah? Yeah, so for the Buddha, the best thing that he can do is just to retire into a cave and do meditation practice. So if he decides to teach, it's actually against his own interest. 
So he has a negative vested interest in teaching her. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it has negative consequences for him. And what that means is that when the Buddha teaches, there's only one single motivating factor, and that is compassion, because he knows he has the ability to help people in the world. Yeah, that's the only motivation of the Buddha. And what that means, when the Buddha does teach us, when the Buddha does give these kind of teachings, uh, they are pure, they are very, very pure, because there's nothing in there whereby he's trying to kind of butter us up and kind of be kind, and you know, he's not a crowd please or anything like that. Uh, he tells you things exactly as they are, out of compassion, to enable you to transcend the suffering in your life uh, and to develop as much happiness as you possibly can, uh, purely from that motive. Uh, and there's something very very, very pure about that, because then you know that these teachings that you read in the suttas, you know you can trust them 100%, because there is no ulterior motive. There is no motive beyond the very idea of just being compassionate and teaching you. And when you know that these suttas are taught entirely for your benefit, yeah, to actually support you, out of compassion for you, when you know that, this is the only reason why these things are there, you read them with different eyes. You think, wow, this is taught purely out of compassion towards me, purely for my benefit, purely to make my life better so I can transcend suffering and all these kind of problems. Yeah, it's like when your mother or someone very close to you in your life really says, listen, yeah, and if you feel the compassion from this other person, whoever that might be, do things this way. Yeah? You're going to be more happy if you do things this way. Don't do it that way. And you feel the compassion from the person you do it because you know they're not trying to control you. They simply have compassion. The Buddha is like that, but a thousandfold more. So read the suttas in that way, that these are compassionate words coming through to you. Every word matters. Every word is spoken for the right reason, not for the wrong reason. And then start to feel these words in a very different way. Just like someone in this life teaches you with the highest kind of compassion. Then these teachings start to come alive. Then you start to understand what is at stake here and how these things actually work. So that is the beginning of the Buddha Nusati. There's much more I want to say about Buddha Nusati. If we don't get a chance to say it all today, you have to come back next year or the year after, or whenever it is that we next time meet. <laughs> I'm hoping I'll be able to say a little bit more, but we also should do some more meditation together as well, for that is the main one of the main purposes of this. So let's do uh, some more meditation and we can do some more talk and Q&A afterwards. So. Okay. <clears throat>